So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Klaus Mielich. I'm the director of the Montgomery Fellows Program. Um, and uh, the Montgomery Fellows Program organized this event and also invited our guest this term, the Montgomery Fellow, Larry Garnick. And uh, yeah, I will say a little bit about the program first, okay. shortly only. Um, the Montgomery Fellows Program is probably the most prestigious program that we have here at Dartmouth. And what we do is we invite um, people who had quite an impact in the field, uh, an impact that is usually not only local or national, but uh, guests that we have usually of international reputation, uh, starting, if we talk in the art world, from Christo um, um, and um, writers like uh, Salman Rushdie here in the summer, but we also have um, people from all fields like politics, from the art world, from music. We have, we had uh, already Yo-Yo Ma here and he is coming back uh, in April uh, as a Montgomery Fellow. Um, so what we have here is um, probably a little bit unusual for an academic environment that we do not only invite academics themselves, but we also invite artists politicians uh, from all walks of life, as I said earlier. Uh, this term, we have Larry Gonick here, and uh, it is a particular pleasure to have Larry Gonick for a very particular reason, because what we also have as a little kind of a task is to bridge always the humanities and the sciences, and Larry Gonick is exactly that. He is an interlocutor between these two fields, uh, the arts, and the sciences, the arts as a cartoonist, and the sciences that he specialized in cartoons on all aspects of the sciences. And I'll read a little bit of a press release that I put together that gives you a little bit of a, uh, an overview of what Larry Gonick is doing. As a cartoonist and graphic artist, he is a pioneering science and social science communicator, best known for his various cartoon guides, as they're always called, cartoon guides and cartoon histories, most notably the cartoon history of the United States and the all-encompassing multi-volume cartoon history of the universe. And I have to say that volume number three was recognized with what one might call or the Harvey, uh, the Harvey Award, which is, so to speak, the Oscar um, for comics and cartoons. His cartoon guides to statistics, algebra, calculus, computer science, physics, and chemistry, to name only a few, have become classics in the world of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. His cartoon guide to genetics, for example, was among the earliest and most accurate modern introductions to the subject written for a broad audience and serving a generation of biology students as a study guide to the field. A Harvard graduate in mathematics with a broad interest in adjacent fields and beyond, I should say, Larry Gonick is considered, and I quote here, the most well-known and respected of cartoonists who have applied their craft to unraveling uh, the mysteries of science, as one of his nominators uh, quoted it, or said. At a time of rethinking pedagogy and new ways of teaching, paired with the copious emergence and popularity of graphic novels, comics, and cartoons, Larry Garnick's work occupies an important space between textbook and popular exposition, a hybrid art that is not a reduction as much as it is a distillation of signs at the level of accuracy, as Larry Garnick always says. Connick's books are often assigned reading in college and high school classes and with his eye-catching and joyful graphics along with precise but human explanations, his science books achieve a level of effectiveness that most lecturers still aspire to. They are truly classics of expository writing and communication, as one of his nominators says. Having Larry Garnick here this term coincided with another other wonderful guest that we have here on campus, and this is Ricardo Siri, uh, probably better known by his second name, which is also his pen name, Ligny. And he is an Argentinian uh, 
cartoonist who currently teaches as a visiting professor in the Spanish department, uh, department on campus. Professor Siri studied advertising, but ultimately decided to pursue a career as a cartoonist. Apart from their different subjects, Linier has one thing in common with Larry Gonick. Both use cartoons to introduce young, and I should probably say also older readers, to certain topics. Ricardo Siri co-authored, for example, a cartoon book entitled Warhol para principiantes, Warhol for beginners. He is also the artist and author of Traveling Rabbit or Rabbit on the Road, a collection of illustrated travel journals uh, that describe Linier's journeys through France, Portugal, Germany, Spain, Argentina, and the Antarctic. And I'm curious to find out how you get these all together. Yeah, In 2013, Ricardo Linier published his first book in the US entitled The Big Wet Balloon. Uh, and apart from appearing in numerous newspapers, journals, and magazines, he also illustrated some covers for The New Yorker. And I would like to say finally a word to our title today, The Dance of Words and Images. Because when we prepared this uh, conversation today, I asked both of them, so you know what I'm always interested as a literary scholar, how do these images and the words go together? How do you decide what goes when and what goes where and how do they interact? And Ricardo came up with that wonderful phrase and he said, well, this is something like the words dance with the images. And Larry responded, and that's our title for today. So please welcome both for our first short presentations of both of them. Each will present their work and then both will have the conversation between the two cartoonists. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Klaus. So, okay, I start and then yeah. So we go in order of uh, age <laughs> <laughs> and uh, from and less and like, with least Harvard titles to more Harvard titles. <laughs> okay, let's do that. So maybe I should explain the image, which is not a cartoon or a drawing, but it's a rabbit with big glasses. I uh, I started. You know, in Argentina, it's kind of hard to decide to become a cartoonist. It's not the most obvious of career choices. My father was a lawyer. I started studying law. He was very happy with my decision. He was like very, okay, we can work together. And then at some point, I realized I was not feeling kind of the vibe, the law vibe. And I was kind of getting this other feeling that I needed to draw penguins and, you know, elves. <laughs> and so the rabbit thing was, I, I love uh, self, uh, you know, I, I am the first victim of my humor. I generally do humor about myself. And I started doing this daily strip, the Macanudo strip, and I decided it would be interesting to put uh, me in the comic as a character, right? And uh, at the Hello. beginning, I, I would do myself, like, you know, I would do this, and uh, little Ricardo, you know, that one would do the beard, and the sadness, the infinite sadness. <laughs> okay, but that's a horrible drawing, you know, so, and, and it, it, it lacked something, and then uh, I was on a trip, uh, they had done this, uh, Inter, you know, interchange, artistic interchange between Berlin and Buenos Aires, and they invited me and 15 other artists who were not cartoonists, who were, you know, like plastic artists and photographers and uh, modern artists to this trip to Berlin. And everybody had to do something on what, you know, how Berlin influenced us as an artist, right? So I was, and I was the first one to have to do this work, how Berlin had influenced and impacted me in this city as an artist, and I have been in Berlin just one day, because I was the first one, and it had zero impact at the moment <laughs> on me, and, but I said, okay, well, I have to do something more like art, because I was surrounded by this amazing artist and, you know, guys doing uh, all kinds of crazy stuff, so I thought, well, maybe I'll draw myself as a rabbit, and then it's art. 
because it's a rabbit. I have like I, I was not thinking very much, but I came up with this other avatar for myself, which is way nicer than this one, you know. And uh, whoop, the, the glasses stay. And then I like the way I came up with this drawing was, and I told my my, my students the other day. A lot of cartoonists draw themselves as some kind of an animal or a weird, different uh, avatar. We have James Kochalka, who's an artist in Burlington, draws himself as an elf, a little like elf ears. And then there's uh, Louis Trondheim in France, who draws himself as a bird. So, you know, cartoonists, we are kind of strange. And uh, I came up with a rabbit because one of my first characters when I started doing comics were rabbits. I loved, like, I was not very good at designing characters, so I kind of came up with this character for myself, which is, I, you know, I was not a very good artist, but I knew some artists do like very abstract, little beautiful comic characters. So, and I love mouse, Art Spiegel the mouse, mouse. So Art Spiegel I would have these drawings of these kind of little, very abstract that you could do that, but then you would. Be, You'd be copying Spiegelman, <laughs> and that is not cool. And then I loved uh, Matt Greening. So Matt Greening would do these stories called Life in Hell before he did The Simpsons. And there were like these kind of gravity things. And then mm -hmm, I decided I would not copy them, but with my ver lack of you know, artistry, I decided that if I did this lower part of this guy, and the topper part of these guys. I mixed the mice with a rabbit. And then I would do this, and that would be my creation. No law could touch me. <laughs> I was, you know, legally, completely, I was like, so, you know, uh, yeah, this is a triumph for art. And I started drawing myself as a rabbit in the daily strip, and, uh, I think it's very clear. I, I just wanted to do something in the Blackboard because I love university Blackboards. You know? <laughs> I have watched way too many American movies of people in universities that I wanted to draw. So I will show you, I will try to explain my work or myself a little bit over the next few minutes. Uh, I, I have this like a potpourri of stuff so that you can get a general idea of what I do. So. My daily strip is called Macanudo. Macanudo is an Argentinian word, which means like everything's fine, everything's okay. Somebody you'd like, you'd say, oh, he's a Macanudo guy, he's really nice. And uh, I started doing this strip in 2002. So the world was in the exact opposite place of Macanudo. You know, the towers are just came down in, in New York, everybody was kind of freaking out. They were already freaking out because the, the, the turn of the millennium generates this kind of, you know, end of the world vibe. And then in Argentina, we have like a huge economic crisis. We had like, a, you know, President La Rua was uh, kind of self-toppled. And then we had five presidents in five days, which was a lot of fun. You guys find out soon enough. <laughs> And, and, I th uh, and the news in the newspaper were absolutely pessimistic. Like, you know, literally the newspaper said, like, we were in the worst economic and the planet and the, you know, Iraq and this and that. So I was kind of freaking out also at the same time, but you would read all these horrible th things in the newspaper, but then you look around at your house and it was not the end of the world, you know, I liked my wife, I liked my, you know, my brother and sister, my mother and father, my friends, we would get together, drink some wine. It was not a horrible, horrible thing. So I thought maybe the newspaper needed a space for optimism. Like the rest of the newspaper is fine to be horribly pessimistic. It was a horrible time in, you know, world history maybe. But it was always also truth that you know, the small things, the small stuff was okay. <laughs> so I thought that the newspaper could have this little space for optimism. And that's why I, I titled this thing Macanudo. Macanudo, which means, hey, it's fine. It's gotta be fine. And 
then I have the, the, the other side. This is from the cover I did for a book that I embroidered myself, and I'm very proud of my you know, artistry there. It took a long time. And so here we have some, some you know, some, uh, I will try to more or less explain what goes behind wh how this, you know, daily strip started. Uh, growing up, I loved the daily strip form, which is a very American form, you know, it's, it's just like jazz. The daily strip started here at the beginning of, you know, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, very related to the newspapers and and this form kind of grew and, and it became the maybe the first and the most uh, related version of the comic. You know, then the comic kind of grew up into books and then graphic novels, but the first version is the daily strip. And growing up, my father would want, yeah, he, he wanted me to learn English. This, and, and uh, you know, me not being a very good student at all, he th th thought maybe if I, you know, buy him some books and magazines in English that he likes, he will start, you know, getting better, which I didn't get that good at. But uh, he would buy me Mad Magazine and then Daily Strips magazines, like Calvin and Hobbes and Bloom County and, and The Far Side, especially those three I, I would read and really like. That's why I didn't become a lawyer also, because if you get a little kid mad, mad magazine, then you don't get a lawyer at the other side of that experience. And, um, and I would love Calvin and Hobbes, and I would love The Far Side. Like these two uh, daily strips are very different. The Far Side is just an image and a text, and, uh, and Calvin and Hobbes is very based on characters. And when I started doing comics, uh, first I have a, a weekly strip and then a daily strip, and I didn't want to feel uh, locked into one concept, you know, or one character, or one type of humor. I have read enough, you know, interviews about um, cartoonists and daily, especially daily strips, artists that they feel trapped by the, the character, trapped by the same type of humor you can do. I have no idea how Schultz did 50 years of, you know, peanuts without hating children and beagles. I, could, I definitely couldn't have not have done that. So when I started thinking about my daily strip, I wanted it to have everything. Like I wanted it to be, if I wanted to go to like a classic little kid daily strip, like, uh, you know, Calvin or Charlie Brown or Nancy or those type of Mafalda, I could do that. If I wanted to be more experimental or weird, like the far side, I could do that. So I constantly stretched the freedom I could from the daily strip. And the first way I found to do this was by designing every strip as it, as it was like its own strip. So I would not respect the, the format, you know, over, uh, over time. So that's why they all change from one day to the next. So one day it could be, there's a little Olive there who was always in like dire, you know, danger, because it's a dangerous life to be an Olive, I guess. And so they were always getting eaten, or the olive would be in, Mar you know, in James Bond's martini and or whatever. And then there's the little cat over there. The little cat was kind of like a Hobbes type of cat or Snoopy, just a cat that you know eventually befriended this little girl, and they have conversations. They have some penguins. They have some you know characters that some characters are just one off, like one idea. Let's see. Uh, Question. Yes. 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 Feel free to ask questions because I meander a lot. <laughs> were these originally in color? And yeah, the, and, they're, and they're in English. Yeah, th they're not in English originally, <laughs> but the daily strip I do is uh, every day is in color. Like in Argentina, the newspaper comes because here you will see generally the daily strip is it has six days in black and white with one format, and the Sunday is in color with a bigger format. Where in Argentina, every day is the same day, <laughs> so. Uh, so every day, yeah, it's in color. These are some in English that I have. That's me, for example, and uh, that's the first rabbits. Actually, that happened to me in Berlin. I was having some sushi, you know, very, very like I thought it was very cool to have sushi, you know. And then I found a hair in the sushi that I was eating. And generally, a pessimist would get angry, but I am an optimist. And I decided that if you find a hair in your sushi, you can 
uh, ask for a wish. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so if you guys ever had like a little hair, you can go like, oh, I wish. And my wish was to be in Berlin. So, you know, it came true. And um, so as you can see, I, I just, I play a lot when I read other cartoonists or I see other artists, when I get really envious of them is if I feel that they had fun doing whatever they is that they did. And, and, and if I think, oh, you know, if I, I don't think Jackson Pollock had fun, but I think on a, on a little side when he was like spewing paint on things, it must have been fun on some level. And so when I see stuff like that, I go like, oh, I wish I could do that. So I try to have fun every day with a daily strip. I have been doing it for 15 years and I still enjoy it. So, and it changes a lot and it's, I try to be as free as it, uh, as space as I can. It became so free that at some point, for example, of the daily strip, when I had my first uh, daughter, Matilda was born, generally cartoonists will just run, rerun old strips. But I ask other cartoonists, oh, do you want to do a macanudo? So I have, other cartoonists do the strip with my characters. They showed that they were way better at it than I was. And, and then for ex one time I was on vacation, I just asked the readers, I, I, by Twitter, I said like, hey, you guys, does anyone want to be published for free in the newspaper, draw some macanudos? I was expecting like maybe 30 that I could kind of get 15 more or less decent. And I got like 300 strips. So I could have retired, well, <laughs> I could have had like a, the, but the newspaper did not let me have a year of vacation. So, uh, but as you can see, I, 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 I'll try anything. Like I, for example, I love Little Nemo because I love, uh, you know, the, I love all the history of comics. So I, I put this Little Nemo format, uh, Little Nemo drawings uh, there. Just do people know who Little Nemo was? So Little Nemo was a, a, a daily, a weekly strip but done by Windsor McKay back in 1906 to 1920-something. I did not know this. And it's one of the greatest, greatest American comics. It just happens it was one of the first as well. Yeah, McKay was a, a lightning fast uh, penman. Yeah. And he actually did all by himself an animated film of the sinking of the Lusitania. Uh, in black and white. No, and he was the first Spielberg. He came up with the first dinosaur for, for the screens, and it was like a really not scary one. Google uh, <laughs> Gertie the Dinosaur. Gertie the Dinosaur. Yeah. So, you know, and generally at the end of the little Nemo, Nemo wakes up, so we have the Enriqueta there falling off of her bed. But as you can see, I tried just to be as free as possible, just because I was scared of, you know, being into a daily strip and then 30 days later, just freaking out that I had no more ideas. So let's, I wanna see, well, you can see, just don't get scared. You can buy the book and then read them. <laughs> so I'll go, I'll go kind of fast here. Then from, uh, from those strips that started to do like incredibly well, from my mind, I was not expecting that they would do as well as they did. I just, my fantasy when I started cartooning was to get a job in a newspaper in Buenos Aires, which is the only way in Argentina that you can make more or less of a living doing comics, because there's no, n not a lot of comics were being published in magazines or, and the, the book industry was dead. There were no comics magazine at the time. So there was just like 10 slots in these two big newspapers in Argentina. And the way it works is nobody leaves those slots, right? So you have 10 really well-known guys that you really admire. And for them to leave the slot, they had to die. So basically you're just waiting for your heroes to die to get, you know, <laughs> like a chance at getting that slot. So you would see them and you go like, hey, they don't, don't look very good, come on, maybe. And <laughs> like right now there are people waiting for me to die. I probably in Argentina must be going like, yeah, he doesn't work out on me. And, and then uh, I, I, but I, once I got there and once the daily strip worked, I, you know, I, I needed something else as well. Like I, I, I get bored very easy and very fast. And the way I treated that daily strip with that freedom and that possibility of you could do anything, I treat kind of my career that way. So 
it's not just, okay, this daily strip works, I will do that for the rest of my life and I, I'm done. I need to experiment and find new ways of, you know, just ex yeah, expressing myself or doing whatever. So I have an, some different aspects of the other side of my career. This is a, a book for kids that I did. The little girl is from the strip called Henrietta. My little cat is called Fellini. And uh, one time I get my girls a box of pencils. You know, I remembered how cool it was when you were a kid and you get this box of, you know, pencils and it looked like a kind of a rainbow. So I did the beginning of this story. Then I th thought, well, what would the little girl draw? So I started drawing like a little girl, which was fun, <laughs> you know. And uh, especially at that moment, I have two little girls living with me in my home, you know, my daughters, and they have so much fun drawing my theory is kids are not scared of drawing you know and, and you know how picasso until adults make them that yeah way. exactly as soon as they go to school suddenly the, this she can draw better than me they can draw better than you you have to do it like this the house is like that the sun is like that but when they're kids it's just pure you know courage and you know how picasso used to say that you know all kids are artists and my like my theory is like when you see Picasso painting, there are all these old, you know, films. He doesn't look scared. He looks like, I'm, you know, like a bullfighter. Ah, I'm going to do this and that. People were scared of him. Exactly. But he is, a, you know, he paints like kids paint. And then when a kid finished a crappy, crappy drawing, they go like, that is a masterpiece. You know, you put that on the refrigerator, that, because that's you. And it's great. And... Picasso is way better than kids, but the feeling is the same, that he will do something, he will, he will know that it's important. So I had fun drawing like a little girl, you know, connecting with my inner little girl, which is exactly in there. And uh, so that's how this story came to be. Let's go for another Big Wet Balloon is another book for kids I did. I, at, the mo at the moment, I had these two little girls you know, Matilda and Clementina, one day they were out playing in the rain. Uh, it was a rainy day, a summer rainy day. They started playing out in the rain. I started seeing like this little play, you know, unfold in front of my eyes because Matilda, who was five years old, he was, she was very much into the rain. She was like, oh yeah, let's go play and run. And Clementina, who was three, was freaking out. She was like, what's going on? I have never seen this. Is it the apocalypse? I have no idea. And, and then Mat Matilda would try to coax her into going into the rain. So I, my brain went like, oh, I can make some money here. <laughs> so I started taking some photographs. And every parent knows that you know, when you have kids, you're always trying to press pause and you know, keep them that way or keep a day for yourself. Like, oh, I want to keep this day forever. And that's kind of the way I found to keep this day. Just kept drawing these girls. They would, you know, daddy, I'm cold. No, go outside. You know, daddy is inspired. But, um, you know, <laughs> this is a, a, a cartoon I did for, for kids for a book here about, you know, fables. This is another book I did with Albert Pla, who's a Catalan um, singer songwriter who's always getting himself into trouble for being very politically incorrect. I do also some, you know, uh, design for book covers and for record covers and for movie covers. One of my heroes, uh, as, you know, literary heroes was Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, you know, I started reading him when I was you know, 16 or 17. I, you know, every chance I could, I would read Vonnegut books. And one time I was like, a friend of mine in Spain wrote like, hey, I'm doing a cover of a Vonnegut book. And I was like, I hate you, you lucky bastard. And uh, the publishers in Argentina for Vonnegut were, oh, you can do ours. So I started doing all this uh, kind of collection of Vonnegut story. And the, the fun thing is, like, you should, you know, whatever work I get into, they, it, there's a different set of tools that activate. You know, my brain has all these different options. And when I work outside of Macanudo, it's, I don't want to do more Macanudo. You know, I don't want to go to the same place creatively or artistically. So for, for this thing, I, I, you know, I kind of feel like Vonnegut has like a, you know, funny, strange 
kind of very colorful humor and sad, <laughs> you know, pessimistic humor. So I would use acrylics and, you know, like, um, like a very kind of pop, American pop imagery. But then for, this is for another kid's book about some, you know, strange little creatures. So I would go back to, you know, watercolors. This is a cover for a record for a Peruvian band, which is very, Spotify it, it's really good, <laughs> called Canaco el Tigre. Uh, this is a, an image for a, for a book on, on books, basically. So I did this Henrietta, having different experiences, reading different books. This is a cover for a friend of mine who's also a musician. Let's see, another Vonnegut. This is, uh, I also, uh, I have this friend in Argentina who's a musician, this guy, yeah, no, Kevin Johansson. He's, his, father, his father was American and his, his mother was Argentinian and Kevin was born in Alaska. So he's, uh, he's the only Alaskan ever to get like a Latin Grammy nomination. <laughs> he's very proud about that. And he always says that he, for him being born in Alaska, everything is the South. So he could see, you know, and, uh, and Kevin at some point, uh, we became friends and he would do these shows and somebody told him, well, you know, your friend draws, he could maybe do something, you know, for the, for the stage. So at the beginning of, of, of this relationship, I would do maybe uh, work with a computer and I would just draw during the show and my drawings would be you know uh, shown bef behind of the band and then kevin started going like oh you should do something more you know more plastic the computer is not my my thing and uh, and i asked him maybe i could do some acrylic stuff and some paintings he was well but you have to do that on stage and uh, then i started doing all these kind of uh, murals that i would do like in real time for a couple of hours while kevin was playing uh, these are more drawings from a collection of stories. It's actually a collection of stories that my mother wrote and they are so weird and scary that I just, you know, I had to do this book because people keep telling me like, you are a very weird, you know, artist. And generally I, I just give them my mother's stories <laughs> and they're like, okay, this will explain it. You know, I grew up with a woman who, you know, she wrote this story about a, she, this woman who had like a son and then the son was a balloon and then the balloon was flying away and she had like this crazy dream about me being a balloon <laughs> and, and the, the, the city was on fire. So yeah, uh, I am not the weirdest one in my family. Uh, this is well, also was painted during another concert. Let's see, some more of those crazy guys, some more paintings, some more Vonnegut. And this is a show that we did with Kevin in Mexico, uh, like a yeah, DVD kind of recording of our, one of our shows. And so it's a CD DVD and I made myself with a really weird arm <laughs> and I'm drawing Kevin's foot. Uh, you know, one day I will give all my drawings to a psychoanalyst. And then like a couple of weeks later, I'll go back for my pills, I guess. You know, just <laughs> make sense out of this. Tell me what with pills work. This is a series I did with a, with a director and, and some actors and friends. Where we did a, a series for, for a channel in Argentina. Again, I am the worst actor ever. But when somebody told me, hey, maybe we should do like a, you know, kind of series my brain has to go there. You know, I, I, I always prefer to be like a disaster, like even a public disaster, but try. And, and this series is kind of, the other three are really funny. So, so, and I play myself, which is not such a big stretch, only like the most horrible version I could do of myself because I'm kind of an idiot. So let's see what else, uh, some other stuff from musicians. This is a graphic novel I did in uh, in a magazine in Argentina. The magazine was a was a monthly magazine uh, called Echo Buenos Aires, which is a magazine that kind of inverts the pyramid of the money distribution. So 
most of the money goes to the people that sell the magazine and the people that sell the magazines are people that live in the street or in kind of a extreme situation you know marginal situation and i really like these guys and the, their work for the magazine and i they, they did a, a story on me way way before i did macanudo and i thought that was so crazy that i told them whenever you need my Anything I can do for you, a drawing, just ask me, because, you know, I love your magazine. Okay. And then a couple of years later, I was doing w better, you know, uh, Macanudo and some books were out. And they called me and were like, hey, we can use you now. So I started doing this graphic novel because I thought it would be fun. And, uh, but it would come like one page every month. So it would be a graphic novel that was done 12 pages per year. And it took me like nine years to <laughs> have it finished. It's a strange book. I'm really proud of it. It's in the in the library. So if you guys go to the library and look for posters by Liniers in Baker Library and want to have like a really weird couple of, you know, maybe half an hour, <laughs> get it. These are my traveling diaries. Like I, like I told later, uh, I, uh, Klaus, when I would travel, I'd like, uh, you know, I would like to just draw the, my, my trips because it's a way to keep them. Uh, whoever does do drawings, they know that if you draw some place or someone, you get to keep it in a different way than if you take a photograph of them. So that's how I would travel back then. Let's, I want to show you that's the New Yorker. Uh -huh. oh, yes, yes. Uh, that I'm still kind of surprised that happened. It was not my my. You know, I wasn't aiming for the New Yorker. I was just very lucky to be in the exact correct moment at the correct place and uh, let's see uh, uh, so here are some of the Macanudo books as you can see I change from cover to cover graphically the way I you know I, I just want to surprise people and I also want to have fun I do not want the collection the same design every time so I did that one with chalk in my kitchen you know in the wall of my kitchen I embroidered that, the other one, and that one with all the cats, I don't know if I have some, well, I'm not going to find the posters, messy. Uh, I'm going to be really fast, don't freak out. Oh, that's me dressed as Yoko Ono, I just wanted to, <laughs> <laughs> with my friend Kevin Johansson as John Lennon. The thing is, Kevin, we were doing this show together, and Kevin called me and said, like, Ricardo, we have to do that photograph of John and Yoko when they were protesting, you know, for peace. Yeah, and 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 as I I knew Ke you know I knew Kevin was going to get to be John, <laughs> and I was getting Yoko. I was I'm a really ugly Yoko, but I just want to show one more thing. Let's see if I find it. Uh, do, 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 do. I, I was a zombie in a movie. Uh, well, I think I'm not finding it. What well, is that? That that's good. No. No, uh, that I just want one last thing that I did that I'm kind of proud of and also was one of the stupidest ideas I ever had was my one of my publishers told me, uh, Ricardo, you, because uh, about all those different covers, right? So I embroidered that one. I did one with chalk. And she said, like, oh, you're just so annoying. <laughs> one day you'll do all, you know, all the covers by hand. And everybody laughed. We were like having a dinner. And everybody was like, ha, ha. I went like, oh, yes, I have to do that. That, that would be so incredible. Because like, like, I thought maybe imagine if one of the cartoonists that you like went berserk and started doing comics, you know, the uh, uh, cover art for each comic. That would be crazy cruel. Uh, so I published 5,000 books with blank covers <laughs> and got some markers. You know, that's how stupid I am. So I, and I will do a very fast so like, you can know how like a lot of months of my life were like. So I got this, is that 3D, okay, by 5,000, right? The one thing we did not think about was how much 5,000 comic covers is. Like I, I didn't even do the math, you know, how you take me to do a cover. And also what we did not think or know was that recently published books have a lot of blue smell. So my house was like a, you know, we were having all these strange dreams. <laughs> it was like really weird. 
And I would do this. I would do like the two colors. First, I would do. There's an end. And then this. And then I would draw the little cat, Fellini, beep, 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 beep. You know? And then I would write Paul. And then I would change color, because it was two colors. And then I do Macanudo. Yeah, number six, four lineas, right? And then the next one. <laughs> How long did it take? Four months of my life. Because when you're like in number 300, you're thinking, this is, this is so avant-garde. You know, this is amazing. I'm like, I felt like Art Spiegelman with Raw Magazine. Like, oh, yeah, this is going to be amazing. When I was in 3,200, I was crying. My, my, my wife was like, they need more covers. The distributor needs 200. <laughs> uh, but now, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> So uh, he is vastly my superior uh, as an artist, yeah. and my stuff is going to look like comics. <laughs> so this, the topic here is supposed to be the dance of words and pictures, right? And you've just seen the pictures, and now I'm, the words are going to come fast <laughs> and furious. I think. Okay. Can we take the lights down a little bit? Is that possible? Oh, no, it's fine, fine. Yeah. Okay. So this is a comic book that I got when I was a kid. It was published in 1957 by the Lufkin Rule Company, um, and it's about the, it's a history of measuring devices and units of measurement, and I thought it was fascinating. Um, I got to get some angle here where I can see what I'm doing. Uh, but look what it looks like inside. It's incredibly text heavy, and yet I found it appealing. Uh, one thing I want to point out also, by the way, is um, the incredible information density of a comic. You know, when Ricardo puts up six daily strips, you can't possibly read that on a slide. You know, when somebody does a PowerPoint slide, they can't put up nearly as much information as, as you would in a page of comics. Um, I'm not going to read this. I did you know, make a detail of it. And this was about the introduction of the metric system and how you could be put in jail for selling eggs by the dozen um, <laughs> under the French, you know, so it, it's obviously the information that hooked me. The drawing isn't anything wonderful. It looks like the old Classics Illustrated com Comics. Anybody here remember Classics Illustrated Comics? Anybody here never heard of Classics Illustrated <laughs> Comics? Okay, yeah. Well, they were just what they sound like. They were kind of uh, <laughs> hack work, uh, comic book versions of famous novels. Anybody here heard of novels? <laughs> uh, so that was, you know, these, I'm giving you my influences. You know, so this is the information flow. And then the other great influence was the cartoonist Walt Kelly, who also nobody has ever heard of anymore who did a strip called Pogo, which was a great political strip. Uh, it was a daily strip with a Sunday, and he did comic books, and he was incredibly prolific. Um, but I thought his political work you know, ended up being kind of, um, became kind of obvious, but he had this unbelievable storytelling ability um, that, you know, that I still love to this day. So uh, you know, this is from Sunday Strip. A collection where where the bear has been pulled out of the out of the lagoon, right? Minus his pants and they with with a kettle on his head, and Albert and the owl are uh, trying to figure out what to do with it. And and uh, see, it's a perfect storyboard. You don't have to. I mean, this is talk about the dance of words and pictures. This is the pictures alone convey this story. But he, meanwhile, he's got this wonderful dialogue going on. So let us saunter on home for lunch. After which, us will return with pitchforks, crowbars, and maybe a little gunpowder, 
and us will pry the boy out of there like the good neighbors us is. <laughs> so meanwhile, Pogo and the turtle come along. Look at there, Pogo, somebody was fixing to cook a grizzle bear. <laughs> Loan me your lawn mower. In a minute, I'll have this bear mowed clean as his newborn babe. But what are you gonna say if the folks come back and figure on eating hair and all? So, you know, great pictures, and then it's got this thing going on, you know? I love that image, a turtle. Uh, mowing of bears behind. Okay, so that's, you know, these are my childhood influences. So then I went to college, this is Seaver Hall at Harvard where the math happened, uh, <laughs> doesn't anymore, it's in the, it's in the science center. And uh, I graduated uh, during the, the crazy 60s. And this was going on, this is 1968, uh, outside the Democratic Convention in Chicago. Um, a lot of people were getting very disillusioned with American society, a, a disillusionment, I have to say, that still persists. Um, and I felt kind of funny about staying in a math department when this was going on. Uh, so at about two years after this, a friend of mine uh, sent someone to me who was looking for an artist to work on a, a, a book he was doing. He wanted to bring nonfiction political comics to the United States, and he'd been in, <clears throat> in Venezuela um, and seen the work of this great Mexican cartoonist who Ricardo has not alluded to, called Rius. Hmm. Rius originated. He's, uh, Carlos did. Uh, who did you do? Uh, 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 see, Warhol for, pre for beginners. Warhol. Yeah. Right. This is, that was a series that was spun off of this. This was the yeah. first one. And this is a great book. This guy, you know, is one of the great cartoonists. His work looks like this. Um, very quick, very inviting, wonderful, funny, savage, um, you know, political, not just political commentary, but actually explanation. It's a history of Cuba. Um, so this guy who came to me, Steve Atlas, wanted to do a book um, on tax reform, which he took to be the dullest subject you know, that he could think of, and it needed the treatment the most, so I started working on it. This is the cover. I don't know why it looks so bad. <laughs> uh, it was done later, but anyway, so I started working on this book while I was in graduate school, and to this page, uh, these are Assyrians running the tax collector out of town. It's what are they throwing at him? Pieces of the last guy. So you can see it's a very reuse-like um, layout, but it's got a little bit of a Kelly line. It's got a, it was done with a flexible quill that makes the, mm. makes the, uh, makes the line bounce a little bit. And in, in the end, I wanted to um, make comics that were, that, that were sort of this combination of an American graphic style uh, and a, and a reuse-y sort of, um, Exposition. Again, there's a lot to read. Usually I read this stuff out loud, but we're, we're time limited, so I'm going to zoom. So I dropped out of graduate school, <laughs> and then I did this. Ultimately, I did some stuff for the Boston Globe, and <clears throat> it was a history of colonial Massachusetts and the Revolutionary War. It was done as a Sunday panel, and, uh, and then it ran out, and I lost that job. And, uh, and so I thought I should do the history of the whole world. Now here I should say that I, respond, I, ha, I was responding to exactly the same thing that Ricardo was talking about. Um, he didn't want to get, in his case, he didn't want to get locked into a particular concept for a strip. In my case it was, I couldn't conceive of, of a lifetime of material just coming out of my head. I would, I would have, if, I, if, if this guy hadn't showed me the comics of Reuse, with, you know, the, where there's a subject at the heart of it, um, I would have stayed in grad school and been a math professor. But because there's always, you know, I had that same fear of getting into something and then just freezing after some period of time. I imagined years, not months, but, yeah. <laughs> but still, you know. Uh, um, but I calculated consciously at the time that if, uh, uh, if I could work in this sort of, in a new form uh, for the United States at that time, that there would be no shortage of material. And I, you know, I was right. So this is, you know, the car first comic book version of the cartoon history of the universe um, with the, uh, 
it was published by what was Rip Off Press, which was one of the centerpieces of a movement of co comics called Underground Comics, which is also something that no, no student at Dartmouth seems to have heard of. Mm -hmm. But all graphic novels uh, and all comics outside of superhero comics are descended from the underground. So uh, this is, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going fast. So the idea is to put a different slant on it from the usual way. And in this case, you know, you, you didn't used to see evolution books talking about sex. So I put the amorous brontosaurus is on the cover. Um, well, all the other dinosaurs tremble. That's I'm, like him. I made a fictitious me. Uh, <laughs> I'm too tall to fit in the panel. So I made one that's four, you know, four heads tall. Uh, nine years, the math department scoffed at my theories. And then more about sex. Here the idea is that, that simple cell division might, might be pleasant too if you're, <laughs> if you're a cell. Uh, and we go on, this is the, uh, the evolution of reptiles from amphibians. Amphibians reproduce like fish. Reptiles have to figure out how to fertilize eggs that aren't laid in the water, you know? So we have this, we have the reptiles to thank. Is this from the cartoon history of the universe? Yeah. Uh, here's the fourth comic book. This is where I get into blasphemy, or let's say, say <laughs> irreverence. This is, this is Samuel and Saul, Saul the prophet, Samuel the king. And uh, uh, what's going on here is that um, King Saul, who has gone out and raided a tribe called the Amalekites, uh, in the 40 years wandering in the desert after the Exodus, Moses decided that the Amalekites were the lowest of the low, and that if you made war on the Amalekites, you, spore, you spared no one. Um, you don't take prisoners, you don't take booty, you, you annihilate, right? That was the, the law of Moses. And Saul went out and he didn't do that. He took prisoners, he, took, he had the king of the Amalekites over there, and, and, uh, and so Saul's reading him the riot act. You know, you wimp. Look, Amalekites to be destroyed, not robbed, but I offered the usual sacrifices. Now, the reason I dwell on this is that I read in a book on the history of religion that this represents um, an advance in religious thinking, right? From this episode comes an early statement that morality is more important than ritual. Hmm. So the quote from the Bible is, does God have his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the word, right? The word is more important than sacrifice. Next time, kill everything that moves. <laughs> so Saul goes over and takes, I mean, Samuel takes Saul's sword and he chops the, the king of the Amalekites to pieces in front of him. And uh, at this point, this is the beginning of King Saul starting to lose his mind, actually. And there's young David playing the harp to uh, get him out of his depression. So, Sex and blasphemy appealed to this person. Uh, this is, this is uh, Jackie Onassis, the widow of, of President Kennedy, who um, it turns out was sort of a cartoonist herself when she was a young woman. And she was working as an editor at Doubleday and someone put my comics in her hands and she published them. Um, so this is the first collection that she was the editor of. And then this is the second one that uh, um, she died just before it came out. And she basically made me a career. Um, what years was it? The first one was 1990. 1990. So a lot of years went by before, before I attained middle class adulthood. Um, and so I got to do more blasphemy. This is from the Bhagavad Gita, um, where uh, the warrior Arjuna is... Uh, is uh, troubled by the fact that he has to go into war and, and potentially kill his cousins. And, but Krishna is his charioteer, and Krishna says, don't worry about it, you know. And he says, why not? He says, because this isn't real. This is an illusion. He says, what do you mean it's an illusion? Well, what's real? I can't show you what's real, says Krishna. It's, it's uh, you know, it's too much for the human mind. Mm -hmm. um, he says, come on, you know, I can't do this. He says, my, you know, please, please, show me what's real. Well, just this once. You want to know what's real? This is real, he says, <laughs> and he shows him this vision of this monster with a thousand mouths, with a thousand tusks, and so on. Um, anyway, I turned into that series. 
Um, it, goes, it starts with the Big Bang, it ends with the first Gulf War, which is where I finished doing the book. Um, in the third book, uh, this is another one, this is about the history of Islam. I decided to do it from the point of view of someone who was just slightly on the outside, who's the cousin of Muhammad's Abu Sufyan, who doesn't mind having his picture drawn. <laughs> that was smart. Huh? That was really smart. <laughs> my my, my self-preservation instinct is powerful. Um, who became the leader of the opposition to Muhammad by default in Mecca. But at this time, so he's got a family, he's a successful businessman, and his, his daughter has joined a cult. That's, that's you know, how you first know that there's something going on. His daughter, in fact, has been, her marriage was arranged by Muhammad, and uh, um, this was one of the things that gave offense to the people of Mecca, that, that, that like any cult leader, um, the prophet was saying, you know, this is, the, this is your family, I'm going to arrange the marriages, you know, your, parent, your family isn't your family anymore. Of course, as things went on, um, Muhammad, the, the Muslim armies defeated the armies of Mecca, and uh, Abu Sufyan had to uh, go uh, eat crow. So he, he went out to see Muhammad, there's his daughter, greets him. Uh, this actually, it's a tiny little drawing, but it's one of my favorites in the book. It's because of the way his right foot is turned in. That's, you know, the way you capture a certain gesture and a little thing. Um, so she says, she pulls the rug out from under him. This is all historical. And uh, I see your manners haven't improved since you left home. And then they tell him to recite the formula of conversion. And he says, he says, there is no God but God, and like that. <laughs> he won't say Muhammad is his prophet, and they say, good enough, you're a convert, and then the Muslims took over Mecca. So the whole thing is to told from the point of view of this guy who, who represents the sort of the business, practical, non-fanatical part of Islam, and in fact, the irony is that it was uh, his descendants who became the first dynasty of uh, caliphs in Damascus the Umayyads. Uh, now I'm going to flash through some big panels. These are pages or two-thirds of a page. This is uh, the, the hordes of Genghis Khan. I couldn't decide, you know, what angle to do it, and then I realized there's somebody at the back, right? So they're going through some mountains, and the sages are saying, truly in every great horde, some guy comes last, truly. Uh, this is Kublai and uh, going soft. You know, he's the, the grandson of Genghis Khan. Uh, this is John Calvin in Paris, 1500s. This is the first appearance of Columbus. The Italians were suddenly, after 1453, when Constantinople was conquered by the Turks, uh, the Italians could no longer go through the Bosporus and trade up in, the, up in the Black Sea where they were accustomed to. So they started going to the Atlantic, and that's why, uh, that's what Columbus was doing out there in the late 1400s. That's him up the mast. Uh, these are the Jews um, en masse leaving Spain days before Columbus sailed. He couldn't, he couldn't get an, a port, a good port anyway, one of the big ports, because they were all full of Jews packing up and leaving. Uh, this is a meeting of African Americans in New York um, that was broken up by the police uh, right after a decision came down in England that, um, that slavery was basically abolished in England. So they had a meeting, but they weren't allowed to meet. Okay, let's see, okay, some science stuff. I did science books. Um, cartoon Guide to Sex, my worst seller. The, the, uh, the, I think the cover is so garish that people are embarrassed to pick it up and carry it across <laughs> a bookstore. And in fact, at one of the house dinners, um, the house professor had ordered a whole bunch of my books to give away to the students who came. And there were two copies of the Cartoon Guide to Sex, and, and these two, two different students brought them to me underneath uh, you know, another book. <laughs> so I'm going to show you some sort of technical stuff now. Are there any science, any STEM people here? 
Yeah, got STEM people. Okay. Um, so from the Cartoon Guide to Calculus, which is one of the quite more recent books, um, comics, cartoons are often metaphors. They don't say what, you know, they're not literal drawings of what's really happening. So this is the, the integral, it's the key to the universe. Okay, so this is a function. A function is an input-output device. It's sometimes represented as a machine, but cartoonists don't, at least this cartoonist doesn't like to draw a machine. So a function is a character that eats numbers, the, the variable, and outputs numbers, the value of the function. So there's <laughs> two and f of two. I was just trying to figure out if I used Photoshop to just copy that figure. I think I did on the one on the left, but I, the one on the right, and the, the two are a little different. So, looks silly, I know. In fact, my old math professor thought it was gross. <laughs> but it gets you something because you can think of the function also as a pointer, right? So the output is, it's just pointing, it's just taking numbers off one number line and pointing to the values on another number line. And so you can fade that character out and make an arrow and, and a way that's never used in an elementary math course, a function can be represented as a bunch of arrows going from one line to another. Now, why is that any good? It's a horrible picture, but yeah, some more. This, that's how a graph works, the thing on the bottom. You turn one of the lines vertical and then, um, but it's, it's a funny way to do business, actually, to be pointing at something over on that line. It's just that you can, because you have a nice two-dimensional surface, you can draw a curve, and the curve tells you things. But it also obscures, to some extent, what's happening with the function. So here's back to this picture. Uh, anybody, how many ha have taken calculus? Okay, no, I didn't. Huh? <laughs> so the derivative of a function Let's suppose you're at a point x up there, okay? And you take a tiny, tiny, tiny little interval next to x. That's on the input side. And then over on the output side, you see where that little tiny interval goes. The derivative is the scaling factor. that tells you how much bigger or smaller, or if it's negative, flipped this way, that little interval becomes. So the derivative is the multiple delta f on that side, delta x on that side. The difference it becomes, is, is negligible and becomes ever more negligible the smaller the inter interval gets. So the first thing you can see is that the inverse function must have a derivative that is one over the derivative of the original function because the inverse function is the, simply the function obtained by turning the arrows around. So if I blew up by a three to get over here, I've got to shrink down by a third to get back. Simple, can't see that on a graph easily. Um, here's where it gets really gross where one function starts eating the <laughs> output of another function and you get to see the chain rule, which you, you can sort of see the thing about inverse functions on a graph in a clumsy way, but you can't see the chain rule on a graph. The chain rule says if I take one function then I apply another function the derivative is the product of the two, and it's obvious. And if I blow up by three and then I blow up by two, I'm blowing up by six I'll, in the end. So those stupid, gross little characters um, actually get you something valuable. And I've got two more slides from the Cartoon Guide to Chemistry. Uh, this is a periodic table that I tried to make in a comic book form, and I was racking my brains because I didn't want to turn it sideways on the page. And then I realized that I could take the transition metals and pull them out in the loop. And here again, uh, there's a certain loss of detail, but um, there's a tremendous gain in, um, in, in, in structural instruction. That is to say, um, the elements have an eightfold series of, pro you know, their periodicity is eightfold. And it depends on the number of, a number of electrons in the outer shell. So by, by pulling that thing out in 3D and simply making it eight, <coughs> eight columns wide, you, you can see the um, relationship between the table and the number of electrons in the outer shell. The traditional um, uh, representation hides that fact. 
So, oh yes, oh, I got bullet points. This is really for a chemistry lecture, but instead of color, I use character. Instead of being complete, I try and show the structure, like on that uh, periodic table. Instead of describing, we get describing plus illustration that, that is sequential. So unlike animation, you can see different stages of the, of the um, process side by side. Um, the reader uses more than cognition, um, just doesn't just think about the words, but also has some emotional um, involvement with the, with the pictures because they're cartoons. And instead of alienation, um, there's identification or clear, concise, coherent, and cool. Okay, so, and as Klaus said, I call that distillation. Now, started in 1968, riot at the Democratic Convention, blah, blah, blah. It says on my website, I'm only doing this to, to save the world. And now, you know, many years later, um, <laughs> did I succeed? <laughs> uh, this is yeah. Ferguson. What year was that? Was that 2014, 15? When was Ferguson? So there's only one thing to do. <laughs> and now we can open it up for questions and conversation. That was excellent. And the, light, the lights are here somewhere. Oh. <laughs> So you are a very curious cartoonist, like extremely curious. You mean, like, a, like, like a curiosity or a curious about things? Both. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> but it, it looks like everything interests you because, you know, just doing the history of the universe and then calculus and the physics and then, you know. So uh, did you ever meet something you go like, I, I, like, I don't, I'm not interesting about that, interested? Like the Kardashians. The yes, the Kardashians. <laughs> I will never do. I will never do. No, the, the history of the Kardashians. The Great. Philosophy. The philosophy of the Kardashians. <laughs> I mean, especially since you know, I watched the O.J. trial. You know, I knew hmm. who Robert Kardashian was the dad. <laughs> Does anybody remember that? He was. He was the lawyer, right? One of the lawyers. He was the close advisor to O.J. Yeah. Uh, that's all I think of when I see. <laughs> Um, yeah, a couple but, of questions. But, you know, the primary, the primary impulse at the beginning was political. Yeah. So that's what interests me, although now it just horrifies me. Hmm. Um, and I don't know what to do. But, uh, um, and so that informs the approach even to the science subjects. It certainly informs the approach to the history. Hmm. But it also informs the approach to the science subjects, for example. Um, you know, the genetics book was the first science book that I did, and I had this idea, you know, everybody's talking about DNA, DNA, DNA. And eventually I began to think of DNA as being like the executive, you know, and the proteins were like the worker molecules. <laughs> and actually, you know, when you think about it that way and you start bringing the proteins to the fore, you get a much more A, interesting, and B, realistic view of what life is all about. <laughs> um, so... It's, you know, maybe that's a, a misapplication. Really interesting. I, 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 you know, I, I love when uh, scientists become be, becomes artists. It, it doesn't happen that much. It happens every now and then. Like Kurt Vonnegut was an art was a scientist before was he, I didn't know. he he was a I don't remember like a uh, engineer. I have a friend who who was a doctor and then now he's a musician. And every time I see, you see the way that they come up with their art, it's a very different than the way that just the like the artist artist because it's always kind of like has a systemic thing to it. It's always kind of like works with it has has a, like an inner logic that I really don't. <laughs> you know? So I, I, that's what I really like about you. And I think it's just, it's, you just don't start with it necessarily, mm. you know. I mean, I, obviously there's a big difference, you know, between the way you work and the way I work. Mm. Um, sometimes your things are just driven by, by layout, yeah. you know, graphically, like that, that dancing clown figure, you know, and then, but, um, but at some point you have to make it make sense of some kind. It doesn't have to be, you know, logical sense, but it has to make sense to you, right? Yeah. So um, everything I do is driven by words, it's true. The, the preliminary process is 
is words, 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 and, and then you know break it, shrink it down until it's in a comics page, and then bring the characters to it. That's true. That's different. But uh, in the same way, then you know I have to make it work graphically. Mm-hmm. But, so there's a similarity. Um, I just one more thing. I, I've been to the San, the San Diego Comics Convention once, and I don't think I'm ever going to go again. <laughs> but um, I did go in thinking, you know, what I I don't do the same thing as these guys. You know, mm. I, this is a different world for me. And I and after you know two hours, I knew I was completely wrong. Mm. We're all in the same same business, just doing it a different way. You have a question? Well, I'm curious about the kind of uh, optimism pessimism thing. It seems yeah. like you avowedly have chosen a form that, that kind of enables you to feel happy about things mm. in the face of things. My, I, I read just about everything that Gonic has produced, and I think the inescapable conclusion is that humans are just fabulously terrible to people. Mm. And I wonder if that's uh, uh, fabulously terrible to people. I mean, just. At times, that's well. That's history, you know. History's well, know. the bad, the bad news. Mm-hmm. I, I wonder if that, if if you are fundamentally optimistic or pessimistic about you know people, because I, mean, I think when you, when you straight put it out there, it's 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 very clear that the humans are sadistic and everything else. But. <laughs> well, as I said, I'm. He's doing a great effort to be optimist. You can see it. Yeah. He's trying, yeah, trying really to. hard. <laughs> well, I'm fairly pessimistic at this point, but <laughs> but um, you know, my view of it was never you know that I see all people a certain way. You know, that's so. So I I don't really think like that. I don't think. I mean, I know lots of. I have lots of friends. You know, I like mm. people. People are fine. I I go crazy if I don't. See people. You know. Yeah, Emil, on the optimist pessimist side, like I, I, I just really try very hard to be optimistic in Macanudo, which not always is. Sometimes you can see a little bit of a yeah, cynicism. Unless you're an olive. Yeah, <laughs> but just because of the fact that it's in a newspaper and people get hit with the news really early in the morning, and I think it's a nice gesture just to go like, yeah, but. But I, when I do other stuff, when I go outside of Macanudo, maybe not in the kids' books, but, you know, like the graphic novel or I do like a stand-up show or whatever. I have a friend who we do together a stand-up show. It's really another version where I get to be more, uh, you know, do a little more cathartic thing and try to, you know, encounter whatever I do from another side. And then, yeah, I, it can get dark. <laughs> yes. Yeah, <clears throat> what I noticed in both of them I mean, is a question addressing both of you. Um, the, actually, I have three questions that are somehow, I guess, interrelated. The first one um, is the line between comics, cartoons, caricatures, mm. and stereotypes. Um, and, and I was wondering how you deal with that. I mean, there were in Larry's uh, uh, cartoons, there were some of the images of the Arabs. Uh, that reminded me a little bit from my background, German background, I would say, well, I don't know whether that would fly in Germany that easily because you did, you know, the caricature that the Nazis did in the, mm. in the 1930s about uh, uh, the portrayal of Jews is a very uh, difficult thing. So my question is, what is the line between the comic, cartoon, caricature, and then uh, to a stereotype? And related to that, what I notice, uh, particularly in yours, Ricardo, and in many others, is um, you often find uh, cartoons or comics um, where you have animals instead of people. Is that one of the reasons uh, to circumvent the question of the stereotype? Yeah, my exactly. Third, my third, my third uh, mm. it's a, a mere technical thing, is what I also notice in a lot of these uh, uh, cartoons is why do you always capitalize all the words and all the letters? Is there a technical reason for that? Well, but that is a separate thing. So what was the last thing? Why do you uh, the why, capitals. Why are the letters always capitalized in the text? Is that a technical thing? But this is a technical thing. This is thing, historical. It's a historical okay. accident. Mm-hmm. But the first two questions, are they related to each other? And well, I think like he was saying in Maus, in Art Spiegelman's book, uh, the, it's a 
profoundly Jewish story and he had to uh, kind of, when you're telling a story, I think sometimes you have to kind of, you know, generalize this way or that way just in order to, for it to make sense. So the mouse, he depicts the Jewish people as mice, the Nazi, you know, Nazis as cats, Americans are dogs. Uh, pigs. Yeah, and uh, a speak. Yeah, but Spiegelman has this 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 story because you know the Jews were uh, characterized as rats in a in a you know uh, discriminatory way a lot of times in different you know in different moments in history, and he always tells this story about when he was very near Auschwitz and he was doing a a conference, and someone raised their hands and they said you know there's. Don't you think that it's uh, in bad taste to draw Jewish people as mice? And he responded, well, no, I think it's in bad taste Auschwitz. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, I, I think the context is what gives like the real, you know, uh, you know, the real idea of what's behind the comic. If 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 you see the the drawings of the Arabs or you know, and then that particular one was a, yeah. was a sympathetic portrayal, of course, <laughs> yeah. not not a hostile one. Right, he's my protagonist. But I think it's a, it's a, it has to do a lot with context. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. it's not an easy question, um, or that that is, there's not a, it's, <laughs> there's not an easy answer. Um, I mean, just for example, you know, there's this. The Samuel Huntington theory of the clash of civilizations, that the, the Christians and the, the Muslims will always be at each other's throats at some level, you know. And uh, I have to say, you know, I, historically that's a, a complete uh, misrepresentation. But um, I do see in history, you know, that the, there, it, it's, it's hard not to think of, of these, of the groups, the Christians, the Muslims, and the Jews having a certain corporate existence and a certain relationship amongst each other. For example, um, you know, the Jews were people who could, who could exist in both worlds. It was almost impossible for a, a Muslim to exist in the Christian world. Um, and, it, and while it was not hard for Christians to exist in the Muslim world at the beginning, um, particularly because they were taxed, um, they were they were truly you know the you know, later it got to be difficult. Let's just back up on that a little bit. Um, the the Muslim world was mostly Christian for quite a long time, and uh, for maybe a hundred years it was majority Christian, and they and 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 it drove the Christians crazy because they had been used to fighting with each other you know over doctrinal differences, and the Muslims said cut it out you know just. You know, you can't build any new churches, I think they said, but just you just stay as you are. And the reason was that, that, that the Muslims were very lightly taxed and they depended on the Christians to be the source of revenue. Now, of course, that drove the Christians gradually to convert. And by 750 or so, there was a crisis over this and because uh, um, there, 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 there weren't enough people to tax and then... Uh, and then there was so it's all about money and so on you know but anyway <laughs> that's just like that and then and then when you know charlemagne uh, started conquering the uh, the slavs right they made all these conquests of slavs which is when when the word slave came into both hmm. all the western languages and the eastern languages well the people who were dealing those captives would have to be jews because they could go back and forth you know so I mean, once upon a time, there was a guy called Leonard Jeffries, a black guy from New York who wrote an incendiary pamphlet back in the 60s or 70s called, the, the, you know, The Secret History of the Slave, the Jews and the Slave, Slave Trade. Well, it was inflammatory, you know, but it was also not completely false. And the reason it was not completely false is because there, there was this structural reason that, you know, so... of a political response um, in terms of your readers. I'm thinking about how you mentioned that so much of your work is published uh, and bought in, in schools, so I imagine you have a really broad audience, right, that aren't necessarily all 
coming from the same place ideologically. Have you had much pushback politically? No. 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 Something, like, something like maybe because it's cartoons that people are able to kind of Oh, cartoons will really get people irritated. <laughs> <laughs> um, also thinking about the, 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 yeah. the Danish cartoon, right? Mm. Oh, that one. Well, that, you know, I wouldn't have done that. I mean, <laughs> I, I avoided that entirely. The prophet never appears in that comic, in, in this comic book, and it's, it says so explicitly at the front, right? But um, the main use in schools is of the science books, not of the history books so much. And the history books don't always wear their politics on their sleeve. It's, you know, one of the reasons that I started doing it was that you could, it was a good way of telling a story and you didn't necessarily have to make overt political statements. I have a new book out called Hypercapitalism, though, that, that is being attacked from the left and the right. <laughs> you did something right then. <laughs> We're in the same venue, so I know what you're talking about on the underground comics. I just wondered if you studied or been influenced by Crumb? Uh, well, everybody's influenced by Crumb, mm. I guess. I was influenced by Crumb. <laughs> you know, I mean, those comics were were a revelation. You know, mm. so all of you people should look at the comics of R. Crumb, the early comics of R. Crumb. I would say the later ones mm. less thrilling, but. Uh, no, but I was when I when I first moved to San Francisco, I was from Boston. I fell in with the other great cartoonist of the underground a guy called Gilbert Shelton, who did the fabulous Furry Freak Brothers. And there's a definite influence there in, in style and kind of storytelling. Yeah, because he's a he's a much more traditional cartoonist who just happened to use hippie themes. You know. Mm. Yeah, I, I in, in Argentina, I came across some Robert Crumb books at some point, and it, they, I, it must have been 18 or 17, and they blew my mind just because visually they were so, like, beautiful and, and, you know, that I started just copying for the joy of drawing like Crumb. I had no idea I was going to be a cartoonist or anything, but I would just, so I would put and do this big-footed, you know, guys walking, doing crazy hippie things. Keep on, the, keep on trucking. Yeah, kind of those drawings. And then at some point, a friend of mine from school said like, hey, I saw a book of yours published. And I went like, what? <laughs> oh, what? And he said, like, yeah, I saw a book on Kafka that you did because the drawings were exactly like yours. And I went like, oh, no. And then I had to get rid of Crumb. You know, I had to unlearn Crumb just because I wanted to find a drawing that was Mine. Yeah, yeah crumb, crumb makes you do this. <laughs> you, you know, in Crumb, everything is rounded. So, you know, he draws pants and then, and then he shades them. Yeah. So, for a while, and, and, you know, and everything's, everything, the whole panel, everything has value, you know, the grays are all filled in. Boy, yeah, I'm and glad I stopped doing that. And, 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 and every t I, 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 s I have a lot of friends who are cartoonists and you can see their drawings and you can know when they found Crumb. <laughs> you know, you see the drawings and then you go like, oh, this guy just found Crumb because suddenly everything becomes, you know, yeah, very... Big feet. <laughs> yeah. But then I, I think it's interesting right now the way it's red right now because the climate in the, the country... The way, what? The crumb is red right now. It's, it's, it's very hard thematically the way you, I found Crumb, there was a lot of discussion that had not happened yet on, you know, the sex. The, uh, I mean, some of it had, but not all of it. And I think right now a lot of people... You're very young. Yeah, but a, a lot of people right now are having a really hard time on Crumb's, on the kind of misogynistic or whatever, you know, the racial, racial stereotypes. Racial stereotypes. Too, so... Right. It's a really hard read in the climate, I think, culturally, that the United States is right now, or even Latin America, that I know I would, sh if, you know, and I showed some of Crumb stuff to my class, and I could hear the cringing yeah. sound of, you know, my students going like, ouch, you know, are we supposed to like this? Yeah. <laughs> you know, but I, I, for me, everything that steers up a conversation is just interesting. I mean, he's known for, for, for horrible African-American stereotypes, right? Hmm. Um, but he did this strip called White Man. Yeah. Did you know White Man? 
yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's he's about very... the guy in the suit going to work, and he's just, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's a horrible <laughs> indictment of white men. I mean, so. Hmm? Yeah. No, he's just called white man. He's it's just one story, you know. White yeah, man. I think going, it's the thing with Crumb. I, I must, you know, he's he's <laughs> in his car, right? And he's he's, I think and he's in traffic. And, I'm feeling this urge, this overwhelming urge. I have to kill. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. The thing with Crumb or with is that he's a satirist. I was, you know, just talking the other day about this and satire. You need to, you know, it's not a one-way street. It's not a one-way. You ha you need to just go b back and forth. It's not literal. You know, there's this like you know really old uh, writing uh, that Jonathan Swift did about you know just. Right. That eating people the should, babies, right. yeah, eating the, the the Irish people, you know, the, the people from the country could not pay their taxes, and they have like all these babies that they have to feed. So some, you know, Jonathan Swift said like, well, maybe you should just sell the little kids to the, you know, to the landowners, and they should eat the babies, and then that's, I mean, if you, that's taking literal, that guy's a monster, but he's doing satire. He's just showing how freaky and weird and bad the situation is so i think a lot of scrum stuff works on that satire thing and you need to do the back and forth reading of it you know and yet and sometimes time, <laughs> and sometimes you go like oh no robert no <laughs> you know frank about his own sexual urges yeah well. right I me mean, he's a very scrawny guy right you ever met seen him in person yeah no his I, um, his wrists are like <laughs> like this i mean he's really skinny and so he would go to openings and if he saw you know a substantial woman he would just you know jump up on her and ask her to ride ride him around the room you know that's that's crumb i, I suppose it's inappropriate <laughs> yeah. you know and no one ever complained but i think they they <laughs> complain huh? yeah question Another question? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, that it was when you were coming up in Argentina, it was impossible to be a cartoonist mm. unless you had this sort of daily strip gig in the newspaper. Uh, is that still the case? Because I know that in other, mm. my experience in Latin America is in Brazil, and I know that you know, comics and cartoons are sort of booming there, yeah. I think. It's beginning to take hold, you know, in, in uh, I, I started a publishing company in a company, a publishing tent in Argentina for publishing exactly that, graphic novels. A lot of Argentinian uh, amazing uh, cartoonists are way better known in Europe than they are in Argentina. Is it Jose Muñoz or, or Alberto Brescia? They're way better known in 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 Spain, in France, and even in some parts of the United States than they are in Argentina. They have no idea these people exist, and the reason is, I think, one of the reasons is the graphic humor. The had like a big boom with Mafalda, who was like kind of our peanuts. So whoever was in the newspaper, and also the fact that you're in the newspaper. It's really good for a publisher. So whoever was in the newspaper would get the books out, get kind of a name for themselves. But the guys doing comics, they it's just it was way harder. And there's no, an, there's no, there wasn't an output place for them. It's to true do. here too. Until, for a while, yeah. Recently. But then the for graphic novel boom happened, and and I think Mouse was kind of one of the, its you know kind of keys and. And, and, you know, everything that happens here eventually finds its way down to Argentina. Uh, so I hope my... It's a question, though, you know, yeah. it's like, I mean, what's, how many people in Argentina and what's the income distribution and so on? I mean, comic books, you, know, you talk about comics in India, for mm -hmm. example, you know, um, a comic book, if it costs a dollar, that's a lot of money. In a, in a poor country, yeah. uh, I know Argentina is not as poor as India. No, but it's got a lot of. Poor but it's people. it's it's it, the thing with Argentina. It goes up and down. Our economy is this roller coaster, which sounds way more fun than it actually <laughs> is. You know, like it's coasters. like every ten years we go like ah, whoosh, ah you know, and uh, so having a, a 
you know, a lot of people are just want, you know, the reason they go to graphic humor is because it's a safer bet than publishing harder stuff. Like we were reading Alex Sinner, which is a comic by Sampaio Munoz in today's class. And it's this really amazing, like noir comic, but very hard read. You know, it's just people kind of think comics are just easy read. You know, you can read, but this is a hard read. And I think a lot of publishers got scared of that, you know, and did not protect, they eventually did not protect that cultural, you know, which is, for me, it's very sad when you see that uh, a, all these amazing cultural you know, artifacts end up in the hands of, you know, people reading in, in Europe. And I remember being in a huge, like 300, well, huge, 300 people, and, and I asked everyone if they knew who Jose Munoz is, who had just won in Angoulême the Grand Prix, so he was, you know, the biggest prize of comics that there is. And I asked the people in Argentina, who do you guys know who Jose Munoz is? Raise your hand, and there was just one guy. And he was the guy that publishes the comic magazine in Argentina. So I went like, Andres, you don't count. But nobody knew this guy. And uh, so that's kind of the reason we did the publishing thing, you know, just to uh, at least, you know, some money that I get from drawing this little cat, <laughs> little girl, can go towards, you know, this thing. But it's hard. Uh, it's not. It's not an easy. There's still people in Argentina thinking, "Well, comics are for kids." You know, I'm embarrassed to buy a comic. There, there was a similar. I know this is. We're all in the last question, but there was a similar thing happened here. Mm. Um, you know, daily daily comic strips were the way cartooning happened, and then there were some. There were superhero and and also Donald Duck and like that Disney comics. But um, when people started doing comics about other things there's no money in it you know uh crumb became a sensation and then this guy shelton with the, the freak brothers were the all the big best sellers in comics so he did the same thing he put he put his profits from some of his profit he, he well he was a part owner of the publisher ripoff press so he actually i mean the, the fact that the cartoon history of the universe exists mm. um is because gilbert shelton put some of his royalties into the publishing company and published it. Woo, go, sh yeah. go Shelton. Right. So I owe him a, I owe him a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.